Good evening, everybody. And firstly, may I wish you a very happy new year from everybody at LOETB. And um, yeah, what a year, what a start to the year it is. Certainly not the start that we might have expected. And what it might have been somewhat predicted, we probably didn't expect the numbers of COVID cases and stuff. And I think for a lot of people to be really, you know, working from home and working remotely from the, your primary place of work has now looks like it's going to be a lot of 2021 for us as well. We wouldn't have expected that, but hey, times are changing and you'll notice the topic for the first webinar of 2021 is motivation and innovation during changing times. Um, certainly, I think people are asking questions of themselves lately about motivation. Like, how do you pick yourself up? How do you keep going? What is it? Um, how, do you, how do you innovate as well in challenging and changing times? Well, today we have two people who are going to highlight. We have speaking to you today, an, an actual superstar, um, an Olympic champion, Bria Larson. We're delighted to be joined by her. Bria is an Olympic gold medalist. Um, I'll give you a little bit more about her later on. And our case of today is going to be brought to you by Emmett Quinlan of EQ Strength and Conditioning. And again, a great story of how a business adapts to digital capabilities and, and takes you know, a strength and conditioning business online, and particularly during a global pandemic and the associated lockdowns and restrictions. Our running order for today is going to be based on the running order that we've very successfully used last year. Um, so to start off, Aiding Pool is going to give us a two minute update on the latest services that the LOE TV are offering. We'll then have our keynote speaker, Bria, will talk to us for about 20, 25 minutes. Um, as usual, we can take question and answers for our, for our speakers. We'll ask you to use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Happy to put questions towards to Bria um, after her presentation. We'll have Emmett on then about maybe 25 to 20 to 5 um, for his piece. And again, I'll invite questions after that. At the end, we'll have a bit of room too for general questions for both panelists. And we can open up in terms of a little bit of a discussion. So as we say, please, if you think of a question, put it to the Q&A, they're happy to put it towards people. Um, later on, next month, in about the middle of the month, for just the date has to be confirmed. The next webinar will be entitled Psychological Safety. And there's a couple of keynote speakers lined up there, bring a little bit more about that later too, but keep an eye on your social media for that. The session is being recorded, but as you know, it's in broadcast mode, so the only people that can be seen and the only participant names that can be seen are actually the posts or the panelists. Um, it will be available then to share or to download in the coming days and it will be available through the LOE TV website or their social media channels. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Aideen Poole to give you a quick overview of the latest services on offer from the LOE TV. Perfect. Thanks a million, Ronan. And welcome everyone to the first webinar of 2021. Um, if you've been with us from the start, you know we started offering these webinars as a support to enterprises during extremely uncertain and challenging times. So we started in October on a weekly basis and due to the success of the first kind of element of the, the webinar, Future Proof Your Business, which was focused on digitalization, we have since kind of taken on the, the new stream of it um, and continue to do it on a monthly basis. Um, so I suppose from ourselves, I'm a member of the employer services team in LOETB. So our role is really to support enterprises in any way we can. And we offer three different um, services through employer services. We have traineeships and um, skills to advance, and we also have apprenticeship services. So we have a huge range of services there to you um, and to service your needs in any way we can. Um, just I suppose to look back, we've really covered a very broad range of topics from cybersecurity to lean management, and they have then filtered into training programs that we have done throughout throughout the year. Um, at the minute, we are looking kind of at our 21 courses, upcoming courses that we will be running. They range from human resource management, personal and professional development, leadership. And at the minute, we are currently recruiting for a supervisory management course and a digital marketing. So all of them will be, we are recruiting. So if you want to just pop us an email or get in contact in any way, if you're looking for more information or to even register, um, just get in contact. So today we're discussing a really, really important topic, especially in our third lockdown, which is now probably the third time enterprises have had to shut. And motivation is a huge, it is, is of huge importance to enterprises to get them through this time and who better to do that only Bria who is an Olympic gold medalist and a motivational consultant so I'm really really looking forward to the valuable insights that Bria can provide us and also our case study Emma Quinnan who has remained hugely innovative 
during such changing and challenging and difficult times. Even when the gym has had to shut a couple of times, he's kind of came back on and he's shown great content, content online. So um, really, really good tips to get from Emmett. And I'm also really looking forward to that. Um, so I'm not going to stay going on. Um, our contact details, I'll pop, pop them up at the end. We'll, we're there, we're here, we're a service. We, if there's anything we can do outside of this or something different that you'd like to see, then please get in contact. But or, other than that, thanks for joining today and pass it back to Ronan. Thanks a million, Aideen. And uh, again, www.loetb.ie as well for any more information on those services. But to move on, because I suppose we have delighted to have Bria and Emmett here with us, so why not just get stuck into the, the meat of what we're here for? And uh, to as I said at the start, we have an actual superstar here. Bria was a 2012 Olympic gold medalist swimmer. She's been 20, 20, 2013 world champion, a three times National Collegiate Athletic Association champion in the USA, and a nine times American record holder, um, as well as being, you know, having a bachelor's degree in psychology and a master's in sport. I'm um, delighted to um, hear Bria speak again. So without further ado, I'd like to hand you over to Bria Larson. Okay, you're on mute, Bria, just take... <laughs> you got me again. <laughs> it's the phrase of 2020 and now 2021. Um, thank you so much for the invitation to come and speak to you all. I'm very excited about it. I know throughout the entire pandemic, there have been a lot of times where we've realized things that we're very grateful for and other times that just kind of came crashing down on us. And that has been a pretty similar topic in my life that has kept happening. And so I kind of wanted to tell a quick story, partly from my childhood going into college and just some different things that I used to kind of help me through to keep myself motivated. So I actually grew up in a very low income area in Mesa, Arizona. And I wanted out at a young age and people didn't really go off to do great things from that area, but I just, I had it in my heart that I really wanted to. I remember my first aspiration was to be an Olympic gymnast. So I would do cartwheels in the front yard every day until I was 12 years old and six feet tall and realized it probably took more than cartwheels to make an Olympic team. But I felt that sport was going to be my way to make something better of myself. So my senior year of high school, my very last year, I realized that an athletic scholarship was an opportunity that I wanted to have. So I found a local swim club team, told them about my financial situation and worked out a deal to where I could swim for free. And from there, I was able to get a partial scholarship to go to Texas A&M University. Now partial scholarship was not going to be enough. And so I did what I had to. I collected aluminum cans on the weekends. I lifeguarded, I cleaned houses. I continued working at Subway. And I did everything in my power to try and have that one thing. And that comes with a lot of sacrifice, but I had that goal so driven that it didn't matter to me. So as soon as I got to college, I thought I had worked so hard in high school that everything was gonna kind of be downhill from there. And it wasn't. Um, I really struggled with academics the first year and trying to um, go up to speed with the rest of my teammates who had 10 more years of experience. And there were a couple of times in practice where my coach, as sweet as he was, would come over and, and very gently let me know that I was slowing everyone down and that I would probably have to finish the swim set on my own in the diving well. And every single time it was absolutely humiliating and it was never meant to be, but it was, it was a hard thing to take. So there was one morning in particular that I had finished up the swim set and gone to breakfast with my teammates and sat down with a big bowl of oatmeal. And I was so excited to eat. I was so hungry and so exhausted that I tried to take my first bite and I started choking on my food. And as, as everyone was watching and wondering what was going on, I realized I was too tired to eat. And at this point I was rather dramatic, but that was how I was feeling. So I went back to my dorm room and I tried to take a nap, but my muscles were twitching so hard that I couldn't fall asleep. And just being so completely overwhelmed with everything going on, I text my mom a letter of farewell <laughs> saying that today she might have seven daughters, but tomorrow she's gonna have six because I'm going to drown in the pool, sink to the bottom, never see daylight again, or I'm gonna fail out of school and not have enough money to come home. But I just felt like nothing was going my way. I was a complete failure at everything I was trying to do and I was ready to be done. And she looked at that message and sent back a very simple phrase that just said, Bria, this is what it feels like to be a champion. How hard you're working 
and how tired you feel. That's what champions do. And I took that very seriously. And I just started to think about all of the different occupations out there, whether they be a grocery store clerk or a car salesman, a lawyer, an architect, a parent, whatever it is, whatever occupation, the champions go to bed feeling absolutely exhausted that they've done everything they could that day to get a little bit better. So I started to want to have that feeling. I started to desire to feel so tired that it was difficult to sleep because that's what I knew it would take to be a champion. So I kept going and I found little tricks here and there to kind of keep me positive and, and keep me excited and things started going more my way. Excuse the puppy parks in the back. <laughs> and so through my freshman year of finding little tips and tricks, I started to get a little bit faster and a little bit more positive. And at the end of my freshman year, I got second place in both the 100 and 200 breaststroke at NCAA championships. And the next year I started writing down my goals and picking up more mental tricks. And at the end of my sophomore year, I got my first American record and national title. Went on to Olympic trials, continued that motivation and that confidence, made the Olympic team and four months later, went on to the Olympic games and got my first Olympic gold medal. But at the Olympic games, something happened that I never would have expected. I was getting ready and I knew that every opportunity I had to swim, the pool was just as long, the water was just as wet, and if I had a lane, I had a chance. And if I just followed my race strategy, everything would work out. So I went into prelims, followed my race strategy and went on to semifinals and then went on to finals. And before finals started, I remember sitting in this ready room and I had visualized winning the Olympic gold a hundred times just that morning. And so I knew going in that I had what it took and that I was going to win. So we marched out there confident in front of 30,000 people and we got up on the starting blocks. I heard the buzzer and I jumped. But while I was still in the air, I realized that the referee never said, take your mark. And when I hit the water, I saw that I was the only one that jumped in. So I slowly came up and I looked around and saw 30,000 people staring at me. All the cameras zoomed in on my face and I was mortified. And I just slowly got out of the water and, and kept smiling and waved to the crowd. And eventually they let us get back up on the blocks. It was a technical malfunction and I had a second chance. So getting up on the blocks, I waited to hear the take your mark. Then I took my mark, the buzzer went off and we all went. But the second time I got so excited realizing that there was a big underwater camera beneath my lane that started rushing with us. And so I chased it as fast as I could. And the last 10 meters of the race, I completely ran out of energy and hit the wall, but kept smiling knowing that I left it all in the pool and then looked up at the board and saw that I got sixth place and was so confused by that. I, I had done everything. And then I realized that by chasing the camera, I had abandoned my race strategy. And I know it's, it's a bit more metaphorical, but that happens to us a lot of the time. When we are in a position that we are so focused on the end result, sometimes we forget about the process that it's going to take to get there. So it's very important that as we go through our planning, that we make sure that we are prepared for anything that might come up. So in, when it came to the relay, I knew that I had to pick myself up, brush it off and get ready for the next race. And that's what we have to do day by day. We tend to have a lot of experiences where we feel like we failed for that day and we need to be able to have a new attitude for the next and able to keep going. So in the relay, we did all follow our race strategy and we did win a gold medal for that one. So it's gonna show you guys really quick, it's kind of fun. Um, so this is the Olympic gold medal from London 2012. And in the center is the goddess of victory, Nike. And she stands in the center of all summer Olympic medals from the very beginning and, and until the end of time. And the back, the host country gets to kind of put their own little logo. So London decided to put the 2012 logo in jewel-like form for the crown jewels of England. The crisscrosses resemble the underground transit tube system. This square represents the modern art era that London has been through. And this is a, the Thames River and a victory ribbon. And then they um, kind of post our events on the side. So that, you know, if you're Michael Phelps and have 28 of these, you know which one is which. Poor guy. <laughs> but one of the, the greatest experiences that I've had after the Olympic games with the medal was at the airport. I was with a teammate who was the second most decorated Olympian of all time. 
And before we got on the plane, we wanted to show our medals to a group of children. So we went over and we shared it with them and had a great experience and took pictures and the flight attendants had seen. So they secretly bumped us up to first class. And as a young 20 year old woman, that was the most exciting thing in my life at that moment out, outside of the Olympic games was getting to fly first class. And when we got up there, we got to meet all of these great people and the pilots had come over and they saw that my teammate had five medals and they were just asking her questions and just looking at her with complete adoration. And then they came over to me and they saw, they saw that I had one in my hand and they said, how many more medals do you have? And I was a bit taken aback and I thought, oh, oh no, um, I only have one. And as ridiculous as it seems as an outsider, take into account that you compare yourself to those around you, of those that are in your class, that are on your playground, wherever it may be. And to see the look on the pilot's face fall in slight disappointment that I only had one gold medal was a very strange feeling. It had taken all of my dreams and all of my proud accomplishments and just kind of stomped them down to the ground. And I had to learn very quickly from there that you cannot compare yourself to others, that it's not always so much about the end result that matters, but it's the actual journey that brings you the prestige. It's the people that you meet, the skills that you develop, the places you get to go to. And now the travel is kind of put on hold for a bit with COVID, but take into mind the, the personal growth that happens with your journey. It's very scary as an athlete to put all of your resources, all of your time and energy and soul and heart into your training just to miss an Olympic gold or miss a medal or miss a national team by a hundredth of a second but we do it because we strive, we strive for that greatness. And there have been plenty of times where I've seen failure. So I wanted to go through a couple of different exercises and things to show you guys. If we can get the screen sharing um, open, then I can kind of go through a little slideshow. There we go, perfect. Perfect, okay, thanks, Aiden. <laughs> so um, I usually have a, a workshop that I go through. So I pick some pieces for you guys to kind of go through them. So first, just to show the, the highlight of my career of jumping in early at the Olympic Games, I had a, a, a stigmatized thought that came with that. After this race, a lot of my confidence started to falter. And I had this constant thought of thinking, I don't want to mess up. And this would travel with me for a very long time until I realized that you cannot allow your past fears to affect your present confidence. Every time you go up to your own metaphorical race, the pool is just as long, the water's just as wet, and if you have a lane, you have a chance. But if you're at the point where you're having a hard time getting started and you have this fear of failure or even fear of success, this will often feed into procrastination. And this can often just kind of downput our productivity. So one exercise that I felt is extremely helpful is knowing your whys. Now there's a, a certain way I like to go about this. I like to ask at least five times. And every time you ask yourself why, you have to go in a positive direction because if you continue to go on, down a negative path, it's not going to motivate you. But when asking yourself why again and again and again down a positive path, you wanna make sure that it's something that really means something to you. Find something bigger than yourself of what you're fighting for. So a lot of the time I have a very difficult time jumping into cold water. And I've gone through so many different why paths of why I should just jump in. And the best one that I've found is I'll look at the water early in the morning and think, why should I jump in? And right away, the first answer is, well, I wanna be faster. Why do I wanna be faster? And then that can go in a lot of different directions. And one that's worked best for me is thinking, well, I need to be able to provide for myself and I need to make more money at competitions. So why do I want more money? Well, I'd like to be able to build my wealth for my future family. I didn't have a lot of opportunities growing up and I wanna change that. So why do you want the wealth for your future family? Well, I don't want my children to have to feel like they need to collect aluminum cans to go to college. I want them to have every opportunity. So if I take the opportunities I've worked for now to go in a direction that will help them in the future, that is what I wanna do. 
and it can keep going from there. What kind of legacy do you wanna leave behind? What kind of example do you wanna to show to others? This can find that intrinsic motivation and that internal fire to really get you going. Now you can use this as an example when you're doing the dishes or having to answer all the emails, but try to make sure you're finding those positive whys, not the negative ones. It's different saying, well, because I don't wanna lose. That can be motivating, but it's just gonna continue down that negative track. And so making sure that you stay positive in this is very, very crucial. So kind of going to recap of that, develop your answers in a positive direction and give each answer some consideration before moving on to the next. Another great way to kind of help you through this is reflect on what you're doing day to day and find the patterns. So journaling is a very useful tool, but I know it's quite daunting for a lot of people. So one that I find is very easy to do every day is a quick bullet journal. So it can go in two directions to kind of help you out. If you have a great day, write down what did you learn? What were you successful in? And what do you wanna work on tomorrow? Go into as much detail as you can. And if you're having a, a negative day, what are you struggling to learn? What do you feel like you failed at? And what do you wanna work on tomorrow? If you write these down every day, you'll begin to see some of a pattern. If you go a full week and a half where everything's going great, and then you have two months of struggling, are you struggling to learn the same thing day by day? What's a different approach that you need to take? Who can you reach out to to kind of break up what's happening? The next is, I kind of mentioned it earlier, but stop the comparison. We each have our own individual journey, our own family members, our own troubles, our own dramas, our own accomplishments. You cannot continue to compare yourself to others because in this world in general, there are giants that are very scary. These are the conglomerates that kind of take over what we're trying to do. But the people who are able to beat the giants are the technicians. If you feel that you are not a giant in the direction you're wanting to go, learn to be a technician. Do some more research, reach out to others to find ways that work specifically for you to try and make your way to the top of the direction you wanna go. And once you get to the top, if you can learn to be a giant technician, that's where your real success comes in. And most of all, you need to learn how to be your own best friend. Now a best friend can be hard on you. It can raise your standards. It can also tell you that you need to relax at certain points. Now this I think is one of the hardest things to do in life in general because it takes a lot of energy to be very introspective. You need to be able to look at your situations from a third person point of view. So what I typically do with this is that whatever problem I may be having, I write it down while I'm emotional because that's when the feelings are the greatest and where you probably feel the most let down. Put that piece of paper away for a certain amount of time. Sometimes it takes me an hour, sometimes it takes me a day. But when you're a little more clear-headed and a little more rational, take that piece of paper out and read it as if your best friend was having this problem. What would you tell them? Now you have to be brave enough to take your own advice. Now this takes a lot of practice, but it is so much better to be your own best friend, constantly cheering you on and letting you know that you do have what it takes and you do have the gut and you do have the heart rather than having a self-deprecating enemy that's constantly putting you down. Take notice of the internal chatter that's in your mind and how you're speaking to yourself. If you have that negative thought that continues to kind of just attack your brain, if you still need to be aware of what that thought is, you can still turn it around so it doesn't hurt you quite as badly. You need to be careful with the language that you use with yourself so you can continue in that positive direction towards your goals. So the three main takeaways that I feel would help the best going through these challenging times is being able to reflect on your patterns so that you can be more successful. Know your whys to, in a positive direction to kind of find that internal motivation, that internal fire to keep you going and continue to learn how to become your own best friend. That is absolutely crucial. And that is my main spiel for today. And I think we have a couple other excellent speakers to talk to you. Thank you, Bria. Um, always, as I say, a pleasure to hear you speak as well. I just want to point out to people, um, let's look at some, at some statistics. Back in 2015, USA Swimming um, had registered with them 362,320 swimmers. How many did ascend to the 2015 Olympics in Re or 2016 Olympics? 49. 
So the, the percentage chance of you being from the USA and representing your country as a swimmer is point zero point zero zero one three percent So just to put in context, I always find the statistics around the Olympics are quite amazing that the number of people who actually represent their country as a percentage of the global population is so small. So again, to have the opportunity to have somebody like yourself, a gold medalist talk to us is fantastic. You spoke a lot there about reflection and even think your piece about following the camera in the swim lane, about how it took you away from your, your kind of your, your race strategy. Take it to the modern day. There's so much distractions in everyday life, you know, in being and work from everywhere. How important is reflecting and, and how, how might people go about, I suppose, starting it and, and sustaining it? So... I typically set an alarm sometimes. If I'm not, if I'm falling behind in any journaling or introspection, I will set an alarm to remind me. Everyone's got a phone nowadays, so it's pretty easy to do it. But I think that being able to really monitor your own actions is the only way to develop better new actions. And it, there are there are going to be a lot of distractions. And so I think being very honest with yourself and part of that being your own best friend, being very honest and understanding where you're faulting and then not giving yourself the excuse. You know, I think it's very easy to say, well, I'm not capable of doing this or that's just not for me. Is that really what you want? Do you really want to be that person that gives in to those temptations or do you want to be the one that is one of the best? So one of the bravest things I think we could do, anyone could do is giving yourself permission to be your best. And uh, Roland Schumann is another very well-known swimmer in, in the swimming community. And he quotes this often, and I love the way he, he phrases it, but he'll say, I wanna be the best in the history of my own body. And that's, that's all we can ask. You know, there are multiple times where I'll talk with younger swimmers and they'll say, do you wanna be the next so-and-so? And I just remember thinking, no, I, I wanna be the first Bria Larson. And I, and I will constantly say that to any other parent that says, I want my child to be the next Brie Larson. I'm like, no, I, I hope they're not. I hope your child is the first Susie Johnson, you know, like be your own hero, be your own star. And it's, and it's scary and it's very intimidating, but make that your challenge. Try to be the best in the history of yourself. That's, that's brilliant advice. And actually I, what I must commend you about your presentation too, and say from our perspective sitting in Ireland it would be kind of more of an American way of doing it but you actually acknowledge like the little failures when things went wrong and and it, it's shown as a, a key part of who you are I think sometimes in Ireland we need to embrace and it's not even failure as such but maybe if things don't work out the way we intend that it doesn't mean that you have failed and it's about she said kind of carving your own story there too and um, somebody just asked when did you actually start keeping the the bullet points in your journal and mm -hmm. Does it have a, did it have a direct link to your performance? Like, could you, could you chart maybe if you lost, if you, if you weren't in journaling as much as you liked it, did it affect your actual sporting performance? I believe so, yes. Uh, when it comes, so different sides to it. The mental side, yes, but athletically, absolutely. Um, after every single race, every performance that you do, your question should always be, how can I get better? If I swam an American record, I would go to my coach and ask the exact same question what went wrong with the race and how can I get better? And if I had, and, and it's, it's difficult to find positives when you feel like you failed at something. But if I had an absolutely terrible race, sometimes I try to get rather excited saying, I know exactly what I need to work on now to get better next time. Um, so I, I believe I didn't always write it down up until maybe halfway through my college career. Um, because before I, I didn't realize the, the, the positive outlook of writing down the negative. Um, up until I, I kind of made my, my oopsie daisy at the Olympic Games, um, it was all positive visualization, all, all positive writing, everything. And I, I think there's a very special place for that. But understanding that you can learn from the failures and, and that there's an advantage of understanding the negatives and being able to leverage that is also very valuable. And when it comes then to, say, bringing your you know, your motivation and your method to working as part of a team, even through training or in competition as well. How do you, how do you make it work? Like, how do you kind of, both from a team performance and a business perspective, how do you motivate a team and, and make sure everybody is equally aim, aiming for be it the same goals or are putting in the same commitment? That's a very good question. Um, I believe that the work ethic of the team 
affects every single person. If someone comes in with a positive attitude, working hard every single day, it can be very draining if others aren't doing the same. And it just takes, it just takes seeing one person start to kind of fall off on their work ethic to make a negative effect on everyone. And so I, I believe that getting together consistently as a team to discuss your goals and to discuss what you're working towards and being very mindful of where everyone's burnout stage is, um, what you can do more as a team to grow closer and stronger is very, very important. Um, I, I know it's, uh, it's funny that you mentioned in Ireland it is different. Um, I became very aware of the, the, the culture changes um, over the past couple months. I had a very wonderful opportunity to work with Zoe Baker and um, one of her swimmers who are in the UK. And they constantly teased me about my American attitude. So I understand that a lot of the ways I do things are a little um, aggressive. <laughs> but um, I think as a team, constantly being aware of where everyone's thought process is and, and bringing, bringing each other around as a, um, a support system and, and making sure that they're all at the same level is, is very important. Yeah, um, I think aggressive is a strong word. Um, I don't think we we, we don't uh, we we don't talk negatively about you for that because actually the reality is like Ireland is a country where there's so much foreign direct investment, a lot of which is headed by American companies, and a lot of the ways we work and do business is actually kind of an American model too. So I think for Irish people, we're such an innovative culture um, that if we could really kind of stick those two together I think we can just continue to be you know what we are in terms of uh, like we're globally recognized for what we do in the country as well another question from a panelist there they're saying that if things are going bad for you and you're getting quite emotional and upset do you acknowledge it and do you react do you just like do you scream do you let off steam or how do you then how do you work about overcoming that and managing those feelings that was a great question um in in private, yes, I have a screaming pillow. <laughs> I think it's it's rather it's rather a good thing to have. I apologize for the dog. getting a little antsy, um, but I I do refer a lot to journaling. I think it's a great way to get all my feelings out on a page and to try and analyze them. Thank you. Um, somebody else wondered, and it was a typical question: How much training did you have to do when you're preparing for the Olympics, and when did you start swimming, and, and how much you know how much we do at a young age? I'm sure I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing the answer to this one. So, actually, very different. I started training competitively at 17. Um, I did summer league growing up, so that might have been five or six hours a week. Um, I did one or two years of high school swimming. Uh, one year was in a state called Idaho, where we did about four or five hours a week. But my senior year, we started doing about four hours a day. So we would wake up and do two hours in the morning and then two hours at night. And when I went to college, the train really ramped up where we do maybe two hours and 15 minutes in the morning and that extra 15 minutes really got you. And then we'd have about an hour and a half to two hours of weight training. And then we would have class and then we'd have two hours at night of swimming again. And then an additional uh, voluntary 30 minutes of cardio. <laughs> And that doesn't include all of the stretching and trying to get enough recovery, going to the athletic training room to get any, um, you know, work done, whether you need massages or any stim treatment, but it is a full-time job. There were quite a few times that I tried to see if I could get a part-time job just to kind of help financially. And it's very difficult. You know, you, you probably spend seven to eight hours a day around your training and that is a, a full-time job. Do you have to be quite selfish to train yeah. to that level? Yes, that's, that's the difficult part. Um, a lot of people ask, how do you balance, you know, friends, family, and swimming? And your friends and family have to make a lot of sacrifices too. Um, there have been a lot of weddings, um, my sister's choir concerts that I've had to miss because of a competition or just a simple practice. And it's heartbreaking sometimes because can't you just miss one practice? Can't you just miss one weekend to, to go off with your friends? And I didn't, and I couldn't. And it, I missed out on a lot of, of typical experiences that people have, but in return, you know, I've been able to travel all over the world and, and I knew the sacrifices I was making and why I was making them, but there were a couple of heartbreaking years where I didn't make the national team. And so I, I gave up, you know, going to friends' weddings and all these things and then didn't get the reward. And, and it was absolutely crushing and Every year that happened, I had to make the decision. Am I going to try again or am I going to move on? 
and, and multiple times um, I did, I kept going and, and was glad I did. So while you're in that situation where you are terrified of not actually accomplishing that end goal, you have to fall in love with the process. You have to find all of the opportunities and take advantage of them through the journey. Because if you find that you become one of the best in your field or area at doing something and the business just doesn't quite get there, you don't end up with nothing. You have all of that experience to offer somewhere else. You have all of that character that you've built up to move on towards something else. There is a point um, as in most careers where you have to decide that it's time to divert to something else, but don't think that you've wasted your time. You have developed tremendously through your journey. You have a really interesting question, just to maybe the last question for this round. Um, a, a participant has asked, you know, people often talk about being realistic versus dreaming big. And it can be quite hard to get the balance right. How do you find the balance between aiming for the highest level, but also being, being realistic and grounded? I think by working backwards. Um, if you do have that, that deep desire um, in you to go somewhere bigger, be very detailed in working backwards of how you're going to get there. I think that makes it a little bit more realistic. So if you believe that as a startup, you can be a multi-million dollar company in five years, 10 years, whatever it may be, how are you going to get there? So using, um, I like to use the Eisenhower idea. It's a, a goal setting framework. So I is for inspiring, D is for difficult, E is for explicit, A is for achievable. Now achievable is probably the most intimidating of whether or not you can actually do it, but explicit is probably the most important, making sure that you have a very detailed plan of exactly how you're going to get there and stay very focused, especially on the mental part, truly understanding and believing that you are going to do it and how you're going to get there. Thank you, Bria. Um, we'll ask you to sit tight for a few minutes. Um, I'm going to invite Emmett Quinlan to talk now. And towards the end, we'll have a bit of space there for a couple of more questions. And I'm sure there'll be plenty more coming in for you. But for now, thank you. Um, I'd like to move on to our next speaker. So to bring the kind of local case study and look at you know, motivating yourself and staff and bring a bit of innovation to your business, I'd like to introduce Emmett Quinlan of EQ Strength and Conditioning. Emmett set up his business in April 2016 and began offering online coaching and training and nutrition services. In 2017, he opened up his own private personal training studio before moving to a much larger facility back in 2018. He's invested a lot in the digital capabilities of the business and in social media platforms Forms, particularly this year in response to the pandemic and the various lockdowns and restrictions. And he's offered alternative modes of training to his customers in a virtual environment. So I'd like to pass you over to Emmett now, and he's going to take us through his story and uh, how his business has reacted and pivoted over the last year. Emmett, you're very welcome. Thank you very much, Ronan. Um, much appreciated and delighted to be on. It's tough to follow up an Olympic champion, but I'll do my best. Um, I suppose I'd just like to give everybody some insights uh, into my background and where it all started to where I am now. So similar to Bria from a young age, uh, I was very interested in sports all the way up along. So I was playing hurling, football, GA, rugby, boxing from I suppose the age of 11 or 12 and really, really enjoyed sports. I never really liked school, but I always enjoyed sports. And I suppose uh, I didn't really want to do my leaving cert, but I was forced to by my parents. And I knew that I wanted, if I wanted to go on and pursue a career in sports, I would have to get my leaving cert. So I did that and um, I got my leaving cert in 2012. And I wasn't too sure what I wanted to do after my leaving cert, but I always knew it was something got to do with sports. So I enrolled in a level five FETAC course in Port Leash College in sport and recreation. And I really, really enjoyed it. So from the get-go, I knew it was something that I wanted to do and it was a course that I was going to enjoy. So when I was in the middle of that course, I started looking up degrees, so a level seven, level eight degrees. And I found one in LIT Turles and it was called Sports Strength and Conditioning. And I suppose from uh, my boxing training, so I boxed for five years and while I was boxing, we used to lift weights and I really enjoyed lifting weights and I was a member of a gym. So I said, look, this, this sounds perfect. It's a combination of the two. It's a combination of sports and strength and conditioning. So all the things that I really enjoyed. So I finished my level five course and I enrolled in LIT in Thurles for the level seven and level eight honors degree. So while I was in, again, I really enjoyed that course, really, really enjoyable. Um, 
while I was in my third year in college, we were asked as part of, of one of our modules to set up two social media accounts. So I set up my Facebook and Instagram, EQ Strength and Conditioning, and I started posting, reg posting regularly on my social media accounts, particularly Instagram. So me and a couple of friends of mine used to train in the gym in the morning before college. And we used to put up training videos, uh, pictures of our meals. I discussed the topics on nutrition, training, and I started getting messages from people. So DMs, people asking me to design training programs for them, design nutrition plans for them. So it sparked a little idea in me. And I knew a guy who designed websites. So I decided to get my own little website designed and start offering online training and nutrition coaching. Uh, that was in third year in college, as I said. So I continued doing that while I was in third year. And I heard Bria mention there that she worked in Subway. While I was in college, I actually worked in Papa John's. So that helped me get through college. So I was working in Papa John's, offering my online coaching and completing my college degree. So in 2017, I completed my four years and graduated with a first class honours degree. And I was only out of college a couple of months and I decided I wanted to set up my own little personal training studio. So don't get me wrong, I really enjoyed the online coaching, but I wanted to coach people in person. And that's where my passion was. So I have a little shed beside my house. It's only 15 foot by 15 foot, so it's really small. But I was out looking at it one day and I decided I was going to turn it into a little PT studio. So I invested a good bit of money in equipment and I stripped the shed out, got it painted, put doors on it, made it look nice and fill it with equipment. So I put that service on my website and was offering online coaching and personal training. So I was really, really busy uh, coaching more people than I could handle. So I had waiting lists from the time I started and that was in September 2017. So I was rapidly outgrowing this and I knew I wanted to move on to bigger and better things. So Bria mentioned about visualization and how she always visualized winning that Olympic gold medal. And I suppose from the time that I decided to open my PT studio, a goal of mine was to own the best gym in Ireland. So that's something that I used to visualize every single day and tell myself that I was going to achieve. So in 2018, early 2018, I went to look at a much larger premises. So the premises that I went to look at was six and a half thousand square foot. So really, really big, um, big difference going from 15 foot by 15 foot to six and a half thousand square feet. Um, but I was willing to take the risk. And as you said, Ronan, I was willing to make the investment. And I suppose to be successful, you have to take calculated risks. And in July 2018, I opened up, opened up that facility and started offering more services. So as well as the one-to-one -one personal training, one-to-two personal training or group personal training, I was also offering group classes. So coaching much more people. And I thought uh, foolishly of me, I suppose, at the start that I was going to be able to do it all on my own. And quickly, uh, I was getting burnt out. So after a couple of months, you go from six o'clock starts, half five starts every day, work until nine o'clock at night. It, it got a bit much for me. So... Luckily, a friend of mine offered to come and work with me. So a friend of mine that I went to college with and that I used to train with, uh, we sat down and had a chat and he decided to come on board and come and work with me. So I was very grateful for that. And he's still with me today. And that was a massive help. And I suppose it helped the business grow and expand. And then in 2019, I took on another member of staff who also completed the same degree as us and then just this year I took on another member of staff so there's now four of us working together um really really busy really hectic um which is a good complaint I suppose we're still offering uh online coaching which I have kind of pivoted back online now due to the lockdowns and each lockdown has brought about different challenges and I suppose I've kind of um, implemented different things at different stages of each lockdown to improve the business. Uh, we were hit with the first one back in March, as everybody knows, and we got back in July and we had to train outside. So that was challenging. What we had to do was bring out the equipment every day, bring it back in, uh, bring it back out in the evening time for different classes. So that was tough. And I also had to get a booking system on my website so that was the first thing, the first challenge, I suppose, because we never had a booking system before. And then we came back. Uh, we were really, really busy. We got hit with another lockdown not long after that. And I suppose my members were looking for a better way to book 
classes they were complaining about the online booking system on the website so there was a lot of I mean, there's a couple of hundred members and they were all on the website trying to book in at the same time and it was a slow process and they were getting frustrated so i needed to make more improvements so i went and got an app developed um which is another uh, improvement i suppose made since the lockdown started and another thing i've done was started offering online zoom classes so for the first lockdown i did those for free i didn't charge anybody and i suppose the second lockdown i realized that that wasn't going to be feasible again because i suppose i still have rent to pay i still have bills to pay and i charge people i charge the members a small fee and that's what I'm doing again this lockdown. I'm offering online Zoom classes. And as I said, I've kind of pivoted back to online coaching because those bills are there. The rent needs to be paid. And I suppose you just have to be innovative and think of ways to come up with the funds to, to make those payments. So that's what I needed to do. Um, it has been challenging. It is challenging. And I suppose Bria discussed motivation as well. And some days motivation can be low but that's where i always say discipline kicks in and i need to continue providing value to the people that i suppose not only follow me on social media but the the members who come to the gym who, who mainly all follow me on social media so i want to continue providing value to them um i want to stay in touch with them so the zoom classes is, is another way of doing that as well as posting regularly on social media um staying in contact with my members through that through whatsapp uh, through our private facebook group and yeah, I suppose those are some of the challenges that we've faced so far. And this pandemic has been tough for everybody. And we're supposed to be getting back to the gym in February and the way the numbers are here in Ireland at the minute, it's not looking too likely. So I'm just, I suppose, trying to stay positive and take each day as it comes, not get ahead of myself. And yeah, continue providing value to the people who placed their trust in me by joining my gym or offering uh, availing of my online coaching services so i suppose ron and that's that's where we're at at the minute uh some of the challenges we've faced some of the improvements i've made and yeah that's where it's at no, thank you. And um, again, very open, very honest story. I think there was a lot of stuff that actually like that reflected what Bria was, Bria was saying about um, particularly kind of their sense of both of you that you're just not going to give up. It's, there's nothing going to stop you. So just for yourself, Emma, personally, how do you kind of track your, your kind of progress or progression? How do you and how do you check in as to how you're going in terms of the overall plan? Uh, that's a very good question. I think obviously in the context of the year that we've all had so far as well, it's, it's a tougher one, but what do you typically do? I suppose one way of measuring or assessing progress is client retention. So if we can continue to keep our clients uh, coming back to us, even after lockdown, after lockdown, and we've actually continued to grow even with all the lockdowns. So not only are we retaining our clients, we're also gaining new clients after each lockdown. So that's a really good measure of progress. I suppose word of mouth is really, really good. So there's constantly new people joining the gym. Uh, they're hearing good things about our services from other members of the gym and then deciding to take that leap because of that. Uh, I also mentioned the goal from day one was to be or to own the best gym in Ireland. And I forgot to mention, we actually won best class in Ireland in 2020. Uh, we were nominated in 2019, but we didn't win. And thankfully last year, 2020, we were awarded best class based gym in Ireland. So that's another good, uh, I suppose, measure of progress to be voted the best is uh, very, very nice. Yeah, congratulations and, and well done. Um, you need to do like Bria now and show us the trophy. But um, question just, <laughs> <laughs> a question for you was from a more commercial sense that I know when the first lockdown came in back in March last year, and a lot of businesses like yours, really nobody knew what to do, what was going to happen. Like we thought schools were going to be closed for maybe two or five weeks. It became five months effectively. And it, it was a lot of a big upheaval for companies and a lot of gyms particular and, and fitness instructors started doing free classes and then obviously you know as the pandemic it looked like it was going to continue for a while you had to look as you said there at the actual business model interestingly how was it for you do you find that actually when you have a charge for your classes do you get maybe a better client and, and possibly more clients because sometimes we're wary of free stuff Absolutely. Um, massive, massive increase in the amount of attendees at the Zoom classes when I actually started charging. So just to give you an example, I suppose for the first lockdown, on average at the Zoom classes, there would have been maybe 20 participants 
and last night I had one and there was 54 participants. So there's been a massive increase in the number of participants since I started charging. And I think people value value services more when they actually have to pay for it. And I realized that from the first lockdown. I thought I was doing good and I thought I was giving something back to the members. And it was, but at the same time, I, I don't really think they valued it. Yeah, I think that's a very fair point. I think we often, and, and sometimes in business, we off, we off overlook that. We don't value our service and, and maybe we lose sense of, of who we are and we're, and we're bending to what other people want. So it's, it's good to hear that too. And in, in order to build the business and, and do as you've done, um, have you relied kind of solely on your own motivation or have you used like outside help or mentoring? Uh, good question again. I've just recently signed up to a mentorship. So one of the world's leading um, fitness mentorships, I've just recently signed up to that, uh, actually only last week. But generally, I I have a good bit of intrinsic motivation myself, so I would be very highly motivated. But I also take member uh, take motivation from the members of the gym also, and seeing their results and seeing how well they do, and not only the members but the staff as well. So we all kind of push each other and take motivation from each other and feed off each other. So it's a, it's a really good it's a good environment to be in, and yeah. motivation is always pretty high. Like say, if there's a day that I'm not motivated, one of the lads will give me a kick in the ass, or vice versa. <laughs> So, and you as a champion boxer, I'd be kind of a bit wary about doing that. Um, I'm going to kind of put a similar question because actually a question has come in for Bria. And again, it's around, particularly around your, the bad days when maybe your coach used to demotivate you. Did you always depend on yourself to kind of get back to where you needed to be? Or, you know, what was the plan around that? Because some, they've also said that like to reach a point where you see yourself as your best friend can take a long time. And, you know, you probably need people along the way. Mm hmm. So I don't think the coach was so much demotivated as he had 40 swimmers to take care of. And, and granted, when I first came in, I was, I was the lowest swimmer. So I wasn't the star that he had to coddle. It was just, you're slowing everyone down, doing great, go do great over there. <laughs> but um, yeah, it's, it was, it was pretty tough. And I think that sometimes not wanting to let other people down. I, I swear this dog just once I start talking, he gets jealous that he's not doing me attention. So, but uh, I, for me personally, it was not wanting to let everyone down. I, I had that almost fear in me. You know, I, I didn't want to let people down. And that's, that's honestly what drove me a lot of the time. And then I got to the point where I mentioned earlier that finding something greater than yourself to swim for. So for me, I always admired and trusted and idolized my, my coaches that I've had. I've been very lucky to have incredible coaches that I felt my performance kind of glorified their efforts. And so when I went into races, it really wasn't for personal glory. It was wanting to make people proud, swimming, you know, swimming for your country, swimming for your coach, swimming for your team. And I, that was my bigger purpose. I know a lot of other athletes will take their religion into account um, when they're trying to do something big and great to glorify their own ideology. Um, but for me, it was for my loved ones that had helped me get there. You know, I, I was very lucky to have um, family friends that had bought me towels to go to college, you know, or bedding. And if I had just quit, I, I would have been so embarrassed. You know, I, I couldn't stand the thought of letting everyone down who, who helped me get there. Because I think, yeah, we can, we can have the right environment, we can have the skill set, we can have maybe the, the correct behaviors in order for high performance. But if you're missing that, that purpose piece, and even, and you say, there can often be a, another step of that spirituality piece on top of that. If you've got all that aligned, it's, it's certainly going to be powerful. But I suppose with the year that has been, um, for a lot of, I presume, like, you know, even teammates or, for, or, you know, people who are currently looking at the Olympics, it's been such a, an upheaval for them because the Olympics postponed from last year. And now there's a huge question mark about whether it can actually happen this year. And there's a danger of it being, say, pushed out until 2024. Um, how would people be preparing and trying to manage that as an Olympic athlete, particularly when you're basically fine tuning your training for, for one summer and then all of a sudden it's been pushed off? It's, I, yeah, it's my personal opinion. I, I don't think it's going to happen. Um, it's just, we had, when we had the International Swim League, we had um, like 300 personnel and we were tested every five days. Everything was social distance all the time. And to think of 50,000 
personnel um, in a small space unless we can get the vaccines out. And, and I, I have full um, faith that Japan will do everything it takes to, to make this happen. Um, but it's, it is a little questioning to whether or not it can. And they won't postpone it another year. If, if they can't do it this year, it'll just be canceled because of the finances of both the Winter and Summer Olympics and how the International Olympic Committee kind of has to balance everything. Um, but I, I hope for all of the athletes training for it, that it happens for them. If that competition doesn't happen, a lot of the international governing bodies of their sport will have some sort of competition, most likely. Um, I know that when the US and Japan and a couple other countries boycotted um, in the 60s, they just held another competition in their host, in their host country. So the athletes will always be able to have a place to compete at some point, unfortunately, if the Olympics doesn't happen. Um, the big part with that is just having the opportunities to show big, big um, international sponsors. And of course, the, the personal glory that comes with it. But um, it is hard. But I, I think that the hardest part through the pandemic, and maybe everyone can relate, is not having someone to blame or to point a finger. It just happened. And there is, there is no greater purpose of, of, you know, what you can blame outside of just the pandem pandemic itself. Yeah, it'll be very different for people if, if that's the way it is. But I suppose you want some recognition for, for the effort that's gone in. And then I'm going to flick back to you for a very businessy question again. People have asked, when it comes to taking your business online um, and developing a business, a couple of quick tips around that, particularly around social media and stuff. Uh, yeah, so I suppose provide value is a big tip. Um, people aren't going to follow you unless you provide value. And... Uh, be consistent is another one. So sometimes it can be hard to come up with posts to put up on social media and it, it can be hard to um, continue doing it and to stick with it. But I suppose you just have to be consistent and continue to provide value. And um, if you want it, you just have to work for it. So like, if you want it to work, you just have to put in the work. Simple as, couldn't have put it any easier. Yeah, that's exactly, the, the, the work will always pay off as well. Um, and one person just asked as well, um, probably, again, either whoever wants to take it as well, but is competing with one's self-achievement a more justifiable and fruitful endeavor than comparing your progress with somebody else? There's a big one. <laughs> your comparison is inspiring you, use it. If it is pulling you down, toss it. That's a, a good answer, but I don't really compare myself to anybody else, to be honest with your own. And I just stay in my own lane and I continue to focus on my own journey and achieving the things that I want to achieve. Because if I start looking to other people and what they're achieving and how well they're doing, it's just taking my focus. So I just continue to focus on what I'm doing myself and stay in my own lane. Interesting because I think we're, you know, once we always have to compare and you'll always be kind of asked, you know, people that you admire or that you aspire to be like. I think it's, it's so important to carve out your own niche of the two. And there's a quick one as well. How do you convert followers and, uh, as somebody's put it, free stuff into actual online bookings? Give away your secrets now. <laughs> um, can't be given too much away. <laughs> Look, I suppose uh, people appreciate it when you do um, give out free stuff, but then there comes a time when you like I said about offering the online Zoom classes, they don't really value it if you give out too much free stuff. So just drop little nuggets, I suppose, and get people interested in your services. Um, so if they can see how good you are and the value that you provide and you give out some of that for free, then you're kind of reeling them in and they'll be intrigued and more inclined to avail of your services. Yeah, thanks a million, Emmett. I'm very conscious of the time, uh, folks. Uh, to Bria and Emma, thank you so much for a really enlightening um, afternoon. Um, it's been a pleasure listening to you both. And I have to say there were a lot more similarities between you than maybe we were initially expecting. And it's, you know, some people have put comments up there around you know, what they've seen from both of you and that all the ingredients for innovation and enterprise are there, which I think that, that goes without saying. So from myself and from everybody at LOETB, thank you so much for, for, for being here this evening. Uh, to everybody who's joined in, uh, thank you, as we always say, tell your friends. Our next webinar will be probably around mid-February. It'll be entitled Psychological Safety. Our keynote speaker on the day will be Laura Delizana, and we're going to talk about psychological safety in the workplace and stuff like that. So again, the team at LOETB are really striving to bring you the latest, most up-to-date kind of current topics that can, can be brought. Thank you all for your comments. There are lots of comments coming in there to the functions as well about, you know, thanking us for putting the speakers up there. It has been a pleasure. 
Um, that is it. The recordings of the webinar will be available in the next day or so. Just check out the LOETB social media platforms. Uh, Aideen has put up a bit of information there about current courses and upcoming courses that will be available to the LOETB. It is turned out to be a great time to for people to upskill and to train because the reality is most courses are all courses are being delivered digitally and uh, unfortunately none of us have anywhere to go. So it's a great time to train yourself up and keep up the personal development. Um, from us all, good evening. Thank you so much for tuning in and look forward to seeing you all again in February. Thank you.